Today is the introduction to programming. So we're going to go over how we program here at Show Up Fitness and how you can make it tailored to whoever you want, whether if you're working with an athlete, whether if you're working for a couple, if you're working with a young kid, elderly, uh, we're going to go over your stereotypical girl program that I would do on 99.99% of my clients that come in. Now, what this does is this allows you guys to really give, it gives you the confidence. And so before we get into the programming talk, I'd like to know a little bit more about where we're coming from today. So we got, I heard uh, Mark sounded like he was on a mafia call. So if you ever need Mark to take care of someone, Mark's from New York, where else are people coming from today? Anyone or everyone? Virginia. Virginia? This is Lois. What was that last one? Virginia, I was just saying this is Lois. Oh, okay, Lois. Mm -hmm. We got Bay Area. Uh, how about Crystal? Where are you from, Crystal? Jordan, Crystal. New York, New York. Brooklyn. New York, Nevada. Christy, are you from Florida? Oh, you're from Vancouver. Okay. Uh, someone's from, who do we got? We got Sarah. She's from the Bay Area. Where are you from in the Bay Area, Sarah? I live in Hercules, which is about like 30 minutes from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the more the way out there, Hercules slash or like that's Valley Jail, right? Getting out there a little bit. <clears throat> So we are going to get into programming. So I've been a trainer for a while. If you didn't hear our talk this morning, we post every one of these into the uh, Patreon. I'm going to clean those up while I watch the national championship game at five o'clock. So we're going to go through and take out all that. I will also have a document that will have the schedule for the week. Danny is going to put all the Zooms in there to make it real easy for you for the rest of the week. For those of you that do need to take the NASM CPT on Wednesday at five o'clock, I'll be doing a review on that. Tomorrow, there will not be a programming call because we're having our special guest for the week, and that is the prehab guys. So we will have our $10 tier, which will get access to one special guest per month, and they're just made at random. So we're going to give you guys a good one for tomorrow, which is the prehab guys at three o'clock. We're going to go over tight hips. We can also throw in some programming stuff just to make it kind of two for one. Th Wednesday will be NASA, and then Thursday we'll get back into programming. So the one of the more common, I put in the, the link up top here in the chat box, this uh, video that I did over the weekend, and that is a, pro a programming video. And that's just going to help you guys understand when you program, you program off of patterns, and that just makes your life a lot easier. So today in class in San Diego, I was teaching and we were talking about if you focus on the, the patterns and not the exercises, just, your life's going to be a lot easier. So who could tell me the, the patterns of movement? You got push, pull, vertical and horizontal, yep. squat, hinge, and unilateral. Yeah. So what does it mean when you pull vertically? What are we talking about? It would be like a cable row. A cable row? Like a lat pull down. Good. Crystal got the hinge in there. Now, what's the difference between a hinge and a squat? Hinge is uh, hip dominant. Squat is knee dominant. So the difference is when I squat... It's going to be my knees moving more. Ah, I can't even give you guys a good example today. Uh, so when I do a deadlift, your hips migrate back. It's more hinge. Think of like a, a hinge on your door. That's going to be more hip, which would be your glutes. We're going over the muscles of the hip and the glute, the, the groups that we're going to be discussing tomorrow. We have the glutes, which is three muscles. We have the adductors, which are three muscles. You have the quads, which are four muscles. The hamstrings, which are three muscles. The calves, which are five muscles the abductors, which are five muscles, technically. So unilateral, some people will refer to this as a lunge. 
some people will even put the hinge into its own category and call it a bridge. And then there's some of the non-conventional ones. Um, how are you liking that book by Pat Davidson, Mark? It's really good, Chris. I mean, it's, it's very technical, so I have to read it a little bit slower than normal just because I got to go back a couple of times to read it, but really good stuff. And a lot of it, you know, speaks to a lot of things, if not all of the things that you have spoken about over the last, you know, eight months to a year that I've been following you. Yeah, so he has, he calls them Rethinking the Big Patterns. So RTBP is his book that Dr. Pavid, uh, Davidson, <clears throat> it's just crazy how he's a smart dude. He has a background, he has a PhD in kinesiology, uh, physiology, and he was a professor in he just hated dealing with all the, the complaining from his students and he wasn't making enough money. I mean, he's still, still probably clearing a good hundred thousand, but he wanted to do more. So he has a gym in New York hype <clears throat> hype, I believe hype. Is that right? Mark hype. Hype. Yeah, I think it's hype hype. Yeah. And so what he does is he looks, he talks about the push and pull hinge squat unilateral, but then he gets into some of the non-conventional ones, the breathing patterns, <clears throat> Uh, transitional, which could be like your gait, throwing, crawling. Uh, there's He talks about sagittal and transverse and frontal. So if you don't know the planes of motions and you start reading these books, you're screwed. You don't know what the hell they're talking about. And and Eric Cressy is a, I would put him as one of the top strength coaches in the world. He's the strength coach for the Yankees now. They just brought him on uh, to help their players. Um, and he has a gym, a very large gym in Jupiter, Florida, as well as Hudson, Massachusetts. Those are two big hubs for baseball on the East Coast. And he's one of the, the top guys out there. And he's referred to as a shoulder guru. And there was a talk that he gave. <clears throat> and one of the feedbacks that he got from uh, one of the people in the audience was that he needs to dummy down the talks because he's using too big of vocabulary. And I loved it because his response was, um, that's exactly what you don't that's exactly what he's not going to do. And so he's going to uh, he up the, the vocabulary because the average trainer just gets a certification and then that's it. And some of you may be in here for your first time and maybe it's just NASM. So we have NASM calls every Wednesday night. <clears throat> this is to teach you how we program here. NASM is not going to quiz you on any type of programming. They're not going to quiz you on any type of anatomy. So we make great trainers. The difference between certifications, they want you to get that next certification. And so they don't even teach you in your NASM, ACE, ISSA, the patterns of movement. They teach you their way of programming exercises. So when you understand how to program based off of patterns, your life is going to be a lot easier. And so these are the patterns of movement. And then we're going to get into how we structure our, our workouts based off of these and what they mean. So again, that link that I put in there is going to go over this in more detail. Because you guys are going to get a good example tonight of how we program. And so in the future, when you have someone who comes in, it's going to make your life a lot easier because you don't have to think about the program. You base the program off of patterns, not exercises. Anyone that says they are bored from exercise, they want more exercises. I will bet my life that they've never had an educated trainer who's progressively overloaded with them. Because if every single time your client comes in and you're giving them new exercises, you better believe their bodies are not going to change that much. Can you guys imagine if I'm your Spanish teacher and I give you five words and I don't talk about those five words for another three weeks and every day I give you five new words and then I have a test uh, three weeks from now on words that we did on the first day. You're going to forget about those first words. It's the same with free throws and, and sport. I like using that. If you want to get better free throws, you shoot more free throws. Imagine if we shot free throws on Monday, Tuesday, we only shot three pointers. On Wednesday, we shot half court. On Thursday, we shot behind the basket. And then the following Monday, we have a free throw contest. And I cut the people who don't make the free throws. That's not fair. You haven't been practicing. And if you want to get better, and if you want to get in the best shape of your life, you need to focus on the patterns that you believe in. And so in the exercise that you choose. So this is how we 
set up our workouts. And all we're doing is taking the group of exercises from over here, and you're going to put it into the core pattern. So these are your core patterns of movement. I don't know why it does that, but oh, there we go. That's not good. There we go. So you take your core pattern. You, you have a bunch of exercises under those core patterns. So let's, let's just do for now four per pattern. So we have a push pattern. Who can name four push exercises? Only one at a time. Push ups. Okay, so we got a push up. I like uh, that. Bench press. What's that? Uh, bench press. Good. What else? Mm, military press. Uh, that'll work. Good. Mm, and another one would be. Shit. Mm, you can add a landmine press. Yeah, let's go landmine. The landmine is more shoulder friendly. We're looking right here. Getting up here can be a little more advanced for those that don't have the prerequisites for shoulder flexion. So those are your push patterns. Let's put them over here. So over here, let's do a pull pattern. So someone else besides Jose and Mark, give me some pull exercise that you like to do. Lat pull down. Okay. Yeah. Pull ups. Yep. What else? Rose. Tricep extension. Um, technically would be pulling, but because it's you it's only one joint, we're gonna be extending. So I put that into a more of a push pattern. And that's more of an accessory lift that we'll talk about here in a second. So I want a multi-jointed exercise. Give me one more. We got pull ups, we got pull downs, which you can put in there, chin ups as well. You got dumbbell rows, cable rows, and let's just do a what's another row you guys are like? Let's do a T bar row for like a machine. <clears throat> That's where you put your chest on the supported pad, looks like a T, and you pull it to your chest. All right, so now we got our, our push, our pull. Now let's go over a, our hinge exercises. What are some hinge exercises? <clears throat> Deadlifts. Okay. Hip thrust. Yep. You got um, Keto Bill Swings. Yep. We're going wings today. What else? Chris, you can throw a little bridge in there. Good. I like it. And then let's go to our squat pattern. <clears throat> Goblet squat. Yep. What else? <clears throat> Front squat, back squat. Pistol squat. One, two, three, four. We'll just go body weight. Can I just erase you? There we go. Okay, we got one more unilateral. Now, you'll notice that over here at the squat, we have pistol. Pistol, you could also put over here for your unilateral. Unilateral just means one part of the lower aspect of the body. So I'll bring you over here. What's your most common unilateral exercise? Lunges. Good. Step up. Okay. I'm actually going to break this down into a few. Of them. We've got reverse lunge, we have a front lunge, we have a step up, step down. And then let's do a uh, Bulgarian. Okay, so these are the main patterns that we have. And then these are exercises below it. So I like to put in at show up fitness, we do a push, we pull, we do a hinge, we do a squat unilateral. Then I'm gonna put a transitional and we do jumping in there. I'm a big believer in jumping, not only because 99.9% .9 of the population screws it up. Who was it? Chris Hemsworth today was fucking doing his Tinkerbell jumps, throwing his arms back and there's one thing you want to get me pissed off on. It's jumping in a, not like an, ath an athlete. And that's going to be anything throwing your arms behind you. So you load your arms because again, if you don't know my background, I'm a strength coach. I've taught triple jump, long jump, high jump. You load your arms, basketball, volleyball, you come forward. You would never jump through the air, throwing your arms back. Now with that being said, if you were a MMA fighter, 
I got you. Maybe you want to come at someone with a need. That's different. But these jumpers that we're seeing on Instagram are not doing that. They're just jumping carelessly through the air. They're not even engaging your type two muscle fibers, but we won't talk about that right now. <clears throat> so when we get into designing the program, so what we have here, we have our core patterns. Now there's some things that we want to look at with the acute variables. Now the acute variables are gonna be our sets, our reps, our tempo, our rest, our, <clears throat> um, what am I missing? Um, that's pretty much good for now. So the main rep ranges that we'll talk about in class will be one to five, and we'll call that strength. It's heavy weight, we have six to 12 which is called hypertrophy. Now, as we, get into the, ooh, as we get into the mechanisms of hypertrophy, you'll see that it's not just six to 12, it's a little more advanced than that. Just for now, we'll keep it as in. Then we have 12 plus, which is endurance. And then we have one to 10, which is power. Those are the rep ranges. <clears throat> now, what do you guys think? The heavier we lift, should we rest longer or shorter? Longer. Longer. Very good. And I don't really even do uh, much on like the actual range, like how long you should be resting for, unless you're going to do a one rep max. If you do a one rep max, you should be resting a minimum, probably five, closer to seven, maybe even 10 minutes if you really want to get that one rep max. So I would call this one more moderate for hypertrophy. Moderate would be maybe two to four, two to five minutes. Longer would be a minimum three plus power. If we want to do explosive, we would want uh, three plus minutes as well. And then endurance is going to be you know, less than 60 seconds. You need to take in consideration who you're working with and what their goals are. Now, don't misconstrue a client coming in telling you they want to get stronger. We don't have to go to a one rep max. As you guys know, if just by doing pull-ups, if you can't do one by doing more, you'll be able to do one. You will get stronger by practicing more. So which rep range do we typically want to start out with beginners? 12, endurance. Okay, and why is that? Um, because it helps with the ligaments and tendon. Okay, and who can tell me the difference between a ligament and a tendon? <clears throat> ligament and a bond, lig uh, bond to bond. And tendon ligament one. Muscle to bone. Thank you. Oh, muscle, yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Bone to bone would be a ligament. Tendon would be bone to muscle, muscle to bone. <clears throat> All right, so client comes in. First off, we gotta be really great with our names. If you forget a client's name, the likelihood of them not showing of up would be very high. We're going to work with a girl today. So what's her name going to be? Sarah. Sarah. Lovely name. So Sarah, she has your stereotypical goals for a girl. And this is, the, I stereotype across the board. Guys are a bunch of idiots. Girls, we can be idiots. We're all a bunch of idiots. If you just call everyone an idiot, then we're, we're good to go. Guys are meatheads, girls can be meatheads. But when I stereotype, I'm not doing this in any negative way whatsoever. In my experience in the United States, when a client comes in, typically if it were to be a girl, guys, girls don't chime in, guys, what do you think the common goals would be for a girl? What do you think she's gonna say? Smaller waist, Smaller bigger waist. butt. Okay. And then do you think she's going to use the words more like jacked buff or more like toned and sleek? Toned and sleek. Now, ladies in here, would you agree? Would you say that's fair? Are we, are we being sexist pigs right now? Or would you say that's fair to assume? That's fair. Okay. That's fair. fair. <laughs> now let's do a role reversal. So guys, shut your mouth. Now, if you had a stereotypical bro who comes in, he's going to be a little overweight. He's going to carry his excess weight in his belly. That's called android obesity. He is a bro, so he likes to lift upper body primarily. What do you think his main goals will be? Chest. Okay. Back. I think that's fair. Chest, back. Anything else? 
bicep, tricep. Yeah, arms. I definitely agree. So I think that the average guy, when he comes in, he's going to say, I want bigger arms. I want a six pack. I want to get jacked. I want to get shredded. I want to look like Hugh Jackman when he was Wolverine. I want to have size on me. I'd say uh, some common exercises that guys like would be bench press, bicep curls, lat pull downs, squats, maybe deadlifts, maybe for girls. Typically you're going to find a lot of compound movements of what you're going to refer to those as. So like a step up curl press, light weight. Typically, if we were to stereotype, which sex do you think rests longer, guys or girls? Guys. Guys. And which sex do you think um, does more cardio? Girls. Girls. Which sex do you think works more on flexibility? Girls. Girls. So you're going to find a lot of these stereotypes come true. Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm going to have guys that will come in and say, I want to work on my traps. <clears throat> I've had guys that will say they, they want to run a faster mile. I've had guys every blue moon will say they want to grow their glutes. <clears throat> it's not typical, though. <laughs> so we will know how to train depending on what we get from you. So the purpose of this little stereotype is <clears throat> you're prepared. So when the client comes in, you go through the assessment. The assessment, you're going to do a PARQ, physical activity readiness questionnaire. You ask the appropriate questions such as, what are your goals? When do you want to achieve them by? What have you done in the past? Do you have any injuries? Should I be aware of any allergens or anything that you have not disclosed? Heart problems in your family. We will check blood pressure. We will do measurements. We will do body fat maybe calipers, maybe the BIA, if you feel it's appropriate, most important. Sometimes I won't, sometimes I will. I do not do movement screens. I haven't done those in years. I know certain associations will have you do an overhead squat assessment. I think that's stupid because when my client comes in, if her goals are to get bigger glutes, why would I have you do this? I'm never gonna have you do this exercise, so why would I screen you that way? Now, if I had an Olympic lifter and he's gonna be doing a snatch, I maybe see the, the value in doing something like that. And so I'm not trying to scare my clients by using fear-mongering words such as, oh, you have this imbalance or you have tightness here. I'm gonna ask open-ended questions and then I'm gonna show you how to move. I wanna see how you move as well. And if you have pain, I'm gonna go through the pattern that you have pain in and I'm gonna analyze it and I'm gonna coach you how to move better. I have never injured a client by not screening them i do not i could not t i don't think ever in my career as a personal trainer have i ever done a stability ball squat with my client a bosu ball squat with a client ah false i did do a bosu ball squat with a client and i do have footage of that and it was a photo shoot and that was in 2010 in san francisco so 11 years ago i did a bosu ball squat with a client I don't do that because the science doesn't support it. The only thing science supports when it comes, comes to unstable surface training. Can anyone tell me? Maybe for like recovery, return to play or something. Explicate a little more. Who do we got here? Who's on the mic? That was Ryan. Brady. Ryan, you're, you're, you're kind of there, but talk to me a little bit more. What do you mean by that? You said well, I'm just, I'm obviously, you know, I coach, so I'm just mm -hmm. thinking it like a lot of times when my guys go down with like an ankle injury or something before, Bingo. Bingo. yeah, that's what the AT will have them do. So the, and what was that word you just said right there? I said the AT athletic trainer. There you go. So when you work with a medical team, medical staff, you're going to have athletic trainer, you're going to have a, maybe a chiro, physical therapist, you got a shrink on your team, you got a lot of access to the different professionals, maybe an RD. So the athletic trainer, if you do have an injury, now there's, there's been studies that will show unstable surface training increases the recovery time in injuries. It helps with the recruitment that has been lost at the hip, specifically the glute med. Now here's my, my guess with this. I don't know how it started, but here's how my guesstimation is. Something like Ryan was discussing, or as a physical therapy aide when I worked in a clinic, <clears throat> I'm not educated. I have no idea how to train. 
I'm an intern, I'm, I'm, I'm subbing in or whatever the hell the scenario is. And I see the therapist doing that exercise and I don't have context. I just see it. I go, wow, that's a cool exercise. So maybe my intent is good. Maybe it's not good. I don't know, but here's my guess. I then go to the gym and I start doing it and I'm fucking huge. So, you know, I, I got giant arms. I have big legs. I'm just a Greek God and I have perfect genetics. So I start experimenting with this BOSU ball, stability ball at the gym. Then you got some kids or some trainers look over and go, holy shit, look at that guy who's absolutely massive. I want to look like him. Therefore, I'm going to start doing that exercise. And voila, now we have a pandemic of unstable surface training. Now, my favorite is the pushback. <laughs> I get so much pushback. And the common one is, well, we need to strengthen our core. And that's a funny one because uh, you guys ever watch X-Men or you know what I'm talking about when I say X-Men? <clears throat> The, yep. the the bad the the good what's his name Doctor X is that his name Professor X, he has that little hat thing he puts on. What's that hat thing called? Cerebro. Cerebro. Oh, good. We got some nerds in the class. I love it. So Cerebro, he puts that on. He can basically read everyone's mind. Well, when they in an exercise physiology setting in a clinic, they put this cerebrum thing on, and they'll have you squat. And what they find is as the weight increases if you properly brace and you teach that, you will have more core stability than doing unstable surface training. And they've repeated this in a clinical setting. The most popular one and the famous one is a 10 week, I will put that in a 10 week unstable surface training, Yukon, Eric Cressy. Now I was at Yukon in 2004. 2005 eric graduated eric cressy in 2006 <clears throat> he has done the most famous study to date and what it did was basically just debunk everything about unstable surface training so here's where people just lose their shit They're like well i've done it before and i feel like it works therefore it's fine to do now in science there's no emotion just like in business, we can't get emotional. I'm not calling you an idiot. <clears throat> I'm calling that exercise stupid. <laughs> so it would be like a friend saying, okay, Chris, I'm going to disagree with you. I still think it's better to drive to San Francisco and then to Las Vegas if you live in LA. You're just going to go, well, we can disagree, but you're wrong. <laughs> and when you tell people they're wrong, it's a personal attack. Well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't care about it. The science says this. Now, if the science were to come out and prove that wrong, I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not going to latch onto that like it's the best thing in the world. Like, oh, my God, I, I'm going to go try to, uh, within reason, you will try to disprove it. It needs to be repeated. That's the beautiful thing about science. But if science supports something and it's been done over and over and over again, you want to implement the strategy that's best for your clients. And if you have a client who's been injured, unstable surface training may be beneficial. Rotator cuff, love it. Knee, ankle, hip, love unstable stuff. Airplanes and chaos push-ups and kettlebell, upside kettlebell presses. Those are, they all have a role for training if there's been an injury. Otherwise, it's what I call fluff. It's an accessory. It is um, Instagram worthy. If you have a client that wants to do it for whatever reason, I will do it, but I will put it in here as the accessory. So I'm going to get your question here in a second, Nick. So when we do our programming, it's a core stable pattern followed by a core stable pattern followed by an accessory. Then we will rest. And then we're going to go back into the core exercise again, adding weight every single time. We will do it for three rounds for beginners. Typically, the rep scheme will be 15, 12, 10. If you want to go 20, 15, 12, that's okay. As long as it's above 10 reps because we don't want to compromise the integrity of the connective tissue. I will get into the rest of the workout and we're going to design it. First, I want to let Nick ask his question. Okay, yes. Uh, just real quick, um, with regards to rings and stuff on calisthenics works, mm -hmm. um, a lot of the calisthenics guys insist upon moving from like say a decline push-up or like where your feet are up and then move to a ring set as a way of moving from as, as a way of progressing to what would be more weight when you don't have weights to work with 
and yeah. their argument has to do with the stability thing, but I'm not really sure what I should be doing here because that's really all I have to work with right now. I mean, would it be better just to use like the rings or should I just stay on the ground with fans and stuff? Well, I think it also depends on the individual you're working with, Nick. You could have a, a, a guy or girl who's in really good condition and they just progress faster. The neurological adaptations are there and they can handle the rings. But I mean, you have to use your judgment on the individual you're working with because as you can probably attest to, if you get someone who is new, the rings may be too much of a progression and then they hurt themselves and they want to blame the rings as, oh, that's how you hurt yourself, which isn't the case. They just weren't ready for it. So I think that the ground would be a good beginning part, but just like if I were to work with you, Nick, or if you were to work with me, you can bring me to the ground and very quickly you can use your experience and judgment to say, oh, okay, that was way too easy for you. Let's progress to the rings. It's just like with when I have a client who comes in, I don't do an overhead squat. I bring him, I go grab a weight. So if I'm going to work with you, Nick, you remember the first day of class, you were there right in front of me. I've never met you before. I give you, you're a bigger dude. So I think I gave you like a 20 pound on a goblet. And I said, do some squats. At no point was I concerned about you hurting yourself. 20 pounds, it's like maybe 3%, 5% of your body weight. It's nothing. So you did the extra reps. I'm checking you out and I go, oh, it's really, really light. You crush that. Let's go to back squats. So it, it doesn't take much just to do a couple reps. And I think it's harmless. We don't need to show off or get too aggressive. <clears throat> cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, she wants to get a smaller waist. And how do you get a smaller waist? We lose fat. We pick better parents for genetics. There's no exercise that we can do to spot reduce, but our clients love spot reducing. So I would put that into what I call an accessory. Now, an accessory has a plethora of little sub uh, categories under it. It could be cardio. It could be an injury. Uh, Ryan mentioned that an athlete hurt his knee or something or an ankle. You could do like a squat into a bench press into some type of rehab exercise there. Uh, maybe you have a client who really likes a specific exercise. We could put that there. I like to make these more unilateral. How we program, we want to go large muscles first based on what their goals are. Proximal to distal. I don't want to do a bicep curl first. If I'm going to do legs, I don't want to do a leg curl or leg extension. I want to do the exercise where I can produce maximal force. And it's all relative to the individual. So even if I have a beginner, Sarah, she's never lifted a weight in her life before. This first circuit, I'm still going to have her maximize within her realm of a beginner. So when we do 10 reps, I want that 10th rep to be challenging. So I will start out with what she wants and I will learn that in the assessment. And then I bring her into the room or the gym or wherever I'm at. And I'm going to do these three exercises. Now we have a programming book that we're going to be releasing. You will see some of these, we will take out the B and we will make the A an accessory. That's what we will typically do with someone who's really overweight to obese and guys, not because guys are overweight or obese, but as we just said earlier, typically guys don't have very good cardio and girls, this is your time to chime in. Who has a bigger ego, guys or girls? Guys, we're a bunch of idiots. And so we don't tell you that we're tired. We don't tell you that this is challenging. You ask a client how they're doing. Let's go, let's go pick it up, pick up the intensity. And the guy has a heart attack. And so I always will start off with the first circuit being easier. And then I'll progress in the second one and make it a little more challenging. And then if I wanted to pick it up and do more cardio or like a Metcon or something like that, that third circuit's when I can do it. Versus I see too many trainers today starting out with burpees and lunges and battle ropes and jumps and agility ladders. They smoke the client and then 30 minutes in, they're about to pass out. I always set the expectations with the client that today's workout will not change your physique. The next one will. So you got to be consistent. If you look back in the last five years of your life, if you have, you know, Sarah, how old do we want Sarah to be? Thirty-four. Thirty-four. So, how, when do you think Sarah was in the best shape of her life? Twenty. Probably 10, 15 years ago, when she was in college or right out of high school. So the big things that have changed. I'm not going to point a finger at hormones. I'm not going to point a finger at genetics. The big things that have changed: stress. We probably don't sleep as well, and when those things are out of whack, our hormones will go up. Our hormones will lead us to eating more. As we eat more, our weight goes up, and we don't move as much. 
So when we increase our calories and decrease our output, we're going to store the excess calories and energy as adipose tissue. And for girls, we're going to store it more in our thighs and our butt. So what we need to do is start being consistent in the opposite, being aware of what we're eating and also increasing our output. So for me, I don't talk much about nutrition the first month. I focus on the output because I'm a trainer. I'm really good at training. I can help you with nutrition, but I want you to earn the right to talk about nutrition. And one of the rules that I have is I will not talk about nutrition outside of protein, eat more fruits and vegetables and water for the first month unless you, until you've trained with me three times for four weeks. So that means after a month, I'll get into a food log or some type of nutritional consultation. I'm going to focus on training regularly. So with what we just learned from a girl who wants to increase her smaller waist, bigger butt, I'm going to start out with the hip thrust. Now, if she's never done the hip thrust before and she's a little, maybe she's overweight to obese, then I would regress it and do a four bridge. So what I do is I just go to the hinge category and I choose one of those exercises. If you wanted to do a kettlebell swing because you love swings, that's okay. If you wanted to do a deadlift because you love teaching the deadlift, perfectly all right. I have found in my experience that the hip thrust is one of the better ones to do because it's less technical. Worst case scenario, you can't do the weight. It's really hard to hurt yourself. If you lack the core strength, which a lot of our clients do, picking up a load with an unstable foundation, it's like building a huge building, but the bottom layer is not strong. And so that's where people will misconstrue the whole stability. Like we got to use stability exercises. No, just by doing a, a hip thrust with light weight and practicing the, the proper uh, form, your core will get stronger. And so I'm going to do 10 to fit. I'll do 15 reps on the first one, depending on the availability of where I'm at in the gym. I'll either do a push up or a pull up. I, I will switch them out. And then I'm going to do an ab exercise here. And I always ask my client, what's your favorite ab exercise? And a common one that I get is bicycle kicks. A lot of my clients love bicycle kicks. So I will do that same exercise, but I teach them to slow it down. Most of the time we go real fast and we do it for reps. I do two or three reps, but I go five seconds from my elbow to my knee. I'll hold for five seconds and I'll have five seconds on the way back. And I like to lift my legs off the ground so my feet are not on the ground. And so it's a constant tension on my core. Two, three reps of that, just smoke your client. I will rest pending on my client's condition state. We're trainers. Your clients are going to buy into your personality. So my client is, I'm going to ask him there. I'm going to say her name. So Sarah, what do you like to do on the weekends? So Sarah, what do you think about the national championship tonight? So Sarah, where do you, where were you born? Where do you live? What's, I'm going to try to build a relationship with Sarah because she's investing into me. And if she thinks I'm a creep, if she thinks I'm weird, if I smell, if I have bad breath, if I don't look the part in the sense that I'm training her in a dental floss t-shirt, there's a high likelihood that she's not going to continue with me because I've turned her off. So I'm going to use this. I'm going to watch. I'm a chameleon. I see when she's ready to go again. I'm going to add weight and then we're going to repeat. Hip thrust again, push-ups off her knees. I'm going to teach you the full range of motion, eccentric, coming back. We're not flaring out. And then we're going to go into bicycle kicks again. For the push-ups, I'm not going to do, so for the hip thrust, I'll do 15, 12, 10 depending on what she can do with the push-ups, I'll probably do like five, 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 maybe even like a, a three, five, three, depending on uh, how well she does. When we do eccentrics, we create a lot of damage. She's going to be very sore from that. I just want to make sure to avoid the elbow flip, the, sorry, the shoulder flipping forward, which is called an anterior glenohumeral glide. We don't want that. Then we'll do the bicycle kick. So three rounds. After those three rounds, every single circuit, so this first one, second, third one, at least one of the time, one out of the nine, essentially, I want to add some value. So with the hip thrust, maybe the last set, I push her knees in to focus on driving out. On the push-ups, I am getting engaged because I have the band under her. I'm lifting her up. I like to get involved at least once, getting a spot. And then I like to say her name as many times as possible, minimum of three. I don't like to count out the reps one by one. I give them fives. All right, Sarah, so we're going to go for 15. Let's see how you do. Good. Nice. Drive through heels. Good work. Good. Good. Make sure to breathe. Breathe out. Nice. There's five. We're doing really good. We got 10 more. Nice job, Sarah. Good work. Good work. Breathe. Push, shoot. There you go. Kicking ass. We got five more. Here we go. Here we go. Nice job. 
I'm encouraging her. I'm keeping her motivated. She gets her 15th. Maybe I decide to have her hold, 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 hold. Nice work, Sarah. Great job. Now we're going to go into the push-up. And then we do the push-up. So the, we have a hinge exercise. We have a push, which will be chest tricep. And then bicycle is the accessory to add because she said she wanted to work on her waist. So then I'm going to go into the next circuit. And I'm going to start out probably with some type of squat variation. So I'm going to do a goblet here. I'm going to do the opposite of what I did on the first A. So if I did a push, I'm going to do a pull. I typically will do a chin up first. And then what exercise would Sarah like to do at the end of this one? <clears throat> Anyone chime in? Payloffs. Payloffs, good. Payloffs is great for anti-rotation, good for the core. So we're assuming Sarah is your average female United States, which would be close to 130, 100, sorry, 169 pounds. Um, we will do the goblet squat. I give her maybe 15s. On the chin up, I always ask beforehand to touch. Sarah, we're going to get you up there. I'm going to lift you up and you're going to just come down on the negative. At any point, if something feels off, just drop. I'm going to catch you and bring you down. Is it all right if I lift you up there by your waist? Guys, be careful your creepy hands. You don't want to get up here and get some under boob, make it uncomfortable for your client. I always make sure we're below the rib cage, lift up. If your client is just a little uneasy and you're just going to learn to read people. And if you suck at reading people, get a bench over there and just assume that your client thinks you're creepy. <laughs> so get your bench, have them stand up there and teach them to get up there and come down. So three rounds again, 15 reps for the goblet, three to five for the chin-ups, payoffs you hold for a good five seconds, bring it back in, switch sides. We go up and wait when she's ready. So we go from 15 to 20. Chin-ups, same thing, three to five. Payoffs, same thing. Last round, I have her do 10. So this is the heaviest one she's done. We're driving through the heel, big toe, little toe, making sure our knees are going through our toes. The last rep, maybe I have my client... She's kicking ass. She's doing really well. The last rep, I have her hold at the bottom. I can make it fun. I take the weight from her. I give it back to her. Maybe we, we play like handoff for 10, 15 seconds, and I give it back to her, and then she stands up. Maybe at the last rep, you push her into the frontal plane, so she has to stabilize. You're pushing her this way, and you're not pushing like this. It's just gradual tension, and she has to push into you. For the chin-ups, maybe you have her hold at the top. There's lots of variations for the payoff. Have her close her eyes, go above her head. Each time we're implementing fit, frequency, intensity, time, type. But I don't want to go from zero to 100. The second set, I don't want to have her try to set a five rep max. Like, no, that's, that's inappropriate at this stage in her training. We do that for three rounds and we go to the last one. So if we've done a, a, a hinge pattern, a squat pattern, a push and a pull, which pattern do you think we're going to do here? Push. push. You could do a push. What else could you do? <clears throat> so think about it. We have a, a leg hinge, a leg squat. What's the last leg exercise we haven't done? Leg movement. Unilateral. Good. So let's do a unilateral. And let's do a step up. <clears throat> now, one of my favorite ones to do is a step up, and then I'll do a press, and then a curl. Because most of the time, you're going to find girls will do a step-up curl press. I really do not like that exercise because it's in, an inferior way to train. Because what you're doing when you do a step-up curl press is you're only training towards the weakest muscle group. And when you do a step-up curl to a press, what's the weakest muscle group? Biceps. Mm -hmm. Your biceps. So we have to use a weight that only our biceps can curl. Whereas if, say, we, we grab seven and a half step up curl press, you have for 10 reps per side. If you would have grabbed a 25 per hand, she could have done eight step ups per leg, which is getting more force production. Then we drop the weight and we go to 15 for military press, which is optimizing for that sexy V taper or that pop, whatever you want there. And then we end off on 10 pound curls. And then if she's really doing well, why not go into the step up curl press at the end as like a little burnout? That's what I mean by that. Got your 25s, step up for six on the left leg, step up for six on the right leg. Put those weights down, grab the 15s, you do 10. Grab the 10s, do some curls. We rest. How was that, Sarah? 
oh, it's really great. She's crushing it. She has her breath. She's doing really well. We go up and wait. She does 30, six per leg. And then we go to 20s for the military press. And then we go to 15, 12 and a half for the curl. But then we do more step ups because she's capable of handling it. Step up curl press then. So now we're getting two for one. And then after we do that for three rounds, maybe you end off on a little um, game like circuit where you ask her how she's doing right now. It's 450. She came in at four. We got 10 minutes left. We only want to do five minutes because I want to stretch with her at the end. So maybe I do a wall sit and then she runs across the gym and she does a wall sit over there. Now, if I'm in a corporate gym or in a gym setting, this is when I like to be on stage. I want people to look at me and I'm going to be loud and I'm going to be the cheerleader because I want people to see like, holy shit, that trainer has energy. That client's having fun. That's what I want. She's doing a, uh, a wall sit and then I have her get down on the ground and do a plank and I'm doing it with her. And we're clapping hands. Then we hop up and we run over there to the other side and we do a wall sit. And then we get down and we hold the push-up position. Maybe we do some knee kicks, whatever, some mountain climbers. We get up, we run to the other side. We make it fun and engaging. And people are looking at us like, holy shit, that's cool. That's the type of trainer I want. The energy's there. The client's smiling, but it's challenging versus the trainers just sitting on their phone counting the reps. And so then when you reflect on the whole workout, we've got our hands, we got a squat, we got a unilateral. we got a push, we got a pull. we got shoulders, back legs we did specific work for her core then we followed up with how was that workout sir how you would you like what didn't you like okay you get feedback this is all it's essentially a survey you know i really didn't like the payoffs i felt a little tweak in my back good to know maybe we went to a transverse movement too fast and we should have done a plank there you're gathering that data payoffs aren't necessarily an advanced exercise but planks are a lot safer we're just doing hypotheticals here Maybe you want to do a side plank instead. Next time that she comes, and the beautiful thing about this, this template is I can move these around as they are. I could have done this first. I could have done this one first because it's still following by the programming rules. Large muscles first, multiple joints first, proximal to distal. So next time that she comes in, maybe we decide to do goblets first. We go a little heavier. And then we go into a push up next. And then we do, she really liked the tricep exercise. So we do kickbacks next. Okay, that's fine. And then we go into a reverse lunge pattern. So we're going to take out the step up and we, because she wasn't sore. So we're going to do some reverse lunges this time. And now what we're going to do at the very end of the circuit, we're going to do bridges instead of hip thrusts. So it's still the same pattern. We're just regressing or progressing within reason. So we put the band around her knees for the bridge and we do sets of 15 or 20 to really get the burn. So that's two different workouts right there. The third workout, she comes in. We start out with hip thrusts again, but this time we go a little heavier. Last on Monday, she started out with 25s. This time, maybe we start with 35s. And then instead of doing a push up, we do incline presses. And then we do a side plank. And then we get into a squat pattern. You feel like she's really owned the pattern. She's ready to do a back squat. That's fine. And then instead of doing a chin up, we're going to do an Aussie. And then we do that accessory. So all I'm doing right here is I'm keeping those core patterns, the main ones, the hip thrust, the squat, the even whether if you want to do a lunge or a step up, whatever it is, we keep those consistent and we constantly do them. But we overload and we get stronger, but we move them throughout the workout. One time she could do a reverse lunge, one time she does a forward lunge, but it's still the same pattern. I will constantly do hip thrusts with my clients, females. I will constantly do squats, constantly do reverse lunges. That's like our go-to. What I change is these accessories. So sometimes maybe I'll do a side band walk and this will be the first workout. Whereas the second workout I'll do clams. That's where you can, what I call to YouTube worthy, Instagram worthy, come up with a new exercise every single time your client comes in, but don't let it compromise the main lift. And that's where we get in trouble is everything is Instagram worthy today. So we see someone doing 45 seconds of jumps. That's hard. Yes. It's also not optimal. Just like driving to San Francisco and then going to Vegas. In terms of travel, you'd be like, that's stupid. Why the hell would you ever do that? You guys are going to understand when people talk about the programs. Yeah, I start out with 100 lunges. Why? That's stupid. <laughs> you 
you want to get in the best shape of your life, right? And you're frustrated because you've been training for the last 14 years, Sarah. But when was the last time you worked with a, a coach who knew what they were doing and understands programming? Every time that you come in, you're going to get a systemized program that's tailored just for you, but we're going to progressively overlook. We're going to do a lot of the same exercises for a good month, but then we're going to change them out. I guarantee you're not going to get bored. Most importantly, you're going to get the results. So as long as you communicate with your client in the beginning, they're not going to get mad. I hear people all the time say, what if my client gets bored? I've been a trainer for 16 plus years and I've never once had a client Never once, never had a client complain about their ass growing. Chris, I really want to have fun. You know, I'm tired of my ass getting bigger. This isn't, oh, actually, never mind. That's exactly what I want. <laughs> they're frustrated because they're not getting the results because there's so much bullshit out there. So you guys learn the patterns that you love. Those exercises, make them your own. Maybe you don't like the hip thrust. You prefer the trap bar. That's great. Maybe you're big into the sumo deadlift. Love it. You love teaching the back squat. That's okay. That's you. That's your individualized aspect of training. So we're consistent. Typically, we're going to train each muscle two to three times per week minimum. So my clients are coming in three times, full body workouts, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. If they can train more, that's when we'll start adjusting. Maybe on Monday, we do upper body. Tuesday, we do lower body. And we'll change it up like that. And we'll get into that programming as we progress through the class. But this is just an introduction to, and this is 99.99%. Every single girl that were to come in here to train with me today, I would take you through this workout. And I would make it appropriate for you. And I would challenge you based on what you're capable of. Even if you've been training for three or four years, I can make this workout challenging for everyone in here. What are some questions that you guys have about introduction to programming? Um, I got one, Chris. Uh, what do you think about the carry pattern? Like, you know, lifting like half of your body weight or more or less a minute to 45 seconds? Uh, yeah, what so, do you think about it? Yeah, so like getting into, uh, like, are you making reference to more of like Metcon, like metabolic conditioning, where you do something for time reps? Is that what you're kind of making reference to? Um, no, basically I hear like, um, like, you know, like, you know, you know, you got the six, like, uh, basic movement patterns. And I heard from, I don't know if it was, I think that it was from, uh, Dan John that basically like carry, you know, he suggests that carry is like, you know, can help you with a lot of things. So what do you think about it? Oh, carries are great. So what Dan does is he puts in here. So instead of doing what we got here. Dan would just add in a, so what I do is I put, I call this transitional and we add in jumps where Dan John and John Russin, they call them carries. I don't mm. like putting carries in there just because it's kind of scares my girls and I typically train mm. more girls. So Jose, I if you were to come in, I'll do carries with you all day long. And I think they're mm. great for you and they're going to help your traps and help your core. It's an awesome exercise. But if you do a carry with a girl, because of the constant tension on the traps, guess what muscle group's going to be really sore tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Your traps. I see. And your I girls see. are going to lose their shit <laughs> if their traps are sore the next day. And so yeah, I, I would just take that out for, for girls. Mm. So what are you implement for the girls instead? Uh, jumping patterns? Like doing jumps, yeah, just doing jumps and, and doing more just unilateral instead. When we have uh, like if you look at that video I just posted in there, I have one for guys as well. And so instead of like doing this right here, where a guy essentially I do a bench press, I'll do like uh, curls. But down here, instead of doing a, a unilateral step up, I'll just do carries there for the guy. Got it. Thank you, hmm? Kimberly. Um, could you please repeat the order? You said large muscle first, and that's the only one I have written down. Yep. So then we want to go uh, multi joint then single joint. So notice how when I do a hip thrust, it's my hip and my knee. My push up, it's my elbow and my shoulder. And then like for a, a band, it's just one joint. So we want to do multiple joint exercises first and then we would do a single joint. So I want to do a chin up before I do a bicep curl. I want to do a bench press before I do a chest fly. Okay, and then 
Was there one more? Is the last one is, is called proximal to distal. So oh, yeah. start with your bigger muscles. My chest, I should train before my biceps. My glutes, I should train before my calves. Okay, thank you. Nick? Yeah, I was going to ask you about like, let's say you get like a really big bro client and he's already pretty bulked up and he wants to take it to the next level. Is there ever going to be a, a time when you deviate from this schematic here and just do like a push day and then a pull day and then a, you know what I mean? Like one. Absolutely. hundred percent. I would say statistically speaking, you're going to be 80 to 90% of your programs will be just like this. You will have, I trained this guy, his name was uh, Jake. And for Jake, he would come to me just to get stronger on bench press. So the whole entire workout was only bench press. We would bench press for 60 minutes. It's a very unique situation because that's what he wanted. Now, if you had a bro that was a bodybuilder and maybe he can't afford training with you three times a week, Nick, and he says, I just want to train with you one time. Can I just do a muscle group per workout? It's fine. So maybe on Monday this week, we just do push. Next week, we do pull. Next week, we do squat pattern. Following week, we do push again, but we do dumbbell instead of barbell. And then we do barbell instead of dumbbell for back. And then we do a vertical push, which will be more shoulders. And then we do deadlifts. Yeah, so you can change it up based on the client's needs. I always set the expectations that I want my clients to work with me five to six times and I work and meet them halfway. But three times is pretty common. So that's why we did a full body here. Yes, Sarah, all the, so the 100 here gets access to everything. So you guys will be, you'll get access to the prehab guys tomorrow and that's at three o'clock. Someone else raised their hand. <coughs> I had a question, Chris. Yep. Um, I'm looking, obviously I've been here a couple of times, but my question is, so warm up, how are you warming up people for these, you know, the full body that you're doing? Yeah, great question. So I encourage you guys and ladies on a Sunday night to come up with a new warm-up routine for the week. Now, obviously for basketball players, it's going to be a little different, but for your general pop, and we will get into more of the strength and conditioning stuff uh, later on, but for maybe this week, I foam roll with my clients every single time before. Next week, I do banded workouts, uh, warm-up. So we do pull-aparts and presses and pay-offs and rows and presses. And then next week I'll do all body weight. And I do like animal flow style, push up, you know, bring my leg through thoracic rotations. Next week, even go online, type in basketball warmups. You do your typical, you know, ankle to your butt and then knee to your chest and you do jumping jacks and you do karaoke. And every single week I'll come up with a new variant of a warmup because that's the stuff your clients like. And it keeps them entertained and engaged. Sometimes I'll do, I'll be selfish. Where if I'm kind of tight in my hamstrings, I'm like, all right, we're going to foam roll our hamstrings for two or three minutes. And I'll get into my hammies. I'll get into my calves. At the end of a workout, depending on the individual, their age and what they want, a lot of times I'll do static stretching because your clients really enjoy it. And you can kind of increase your arsenal of unique static stretches that they enjoy. I'm not a, uh, you'll notice I don't put a ton of the warm up stuff because I think that's almost like your individual app, just uniqueness of what you like to do. I've had clients that, um, Chris, he's one of our like all-time clients. He's consistently trains like 10 times a week. He does double days and he'll run six miles before the workout. And so this is in Santa Monica. So we're, like literally right when he comes in, we throw him a towel and we go right to set one on bench press. We don't do anything because <laughs> he was just running for six miles. And so I think it's a case by case where if you have someone who maybe one of your players has that, that ankle injury, we're going to ease into it a little more. Maybe you got a CEO and you get this all the time. They're, they're on their phone and they're just hammering away and they're super stressed out. They put their phone down. You can just tell they're not there mentally. So Max, our instructor in San Diego, what he does is he has a similar situation, but it's with this, this girl. And so he takes her down to the ocean. They do a walk. It's about a five minute walk. They walk down there and then they do like some thoracic stuff, some just, you know, body weight calisthenics and they walk back to the gym. 10 minutes, that's her warm up. But then she's in a good mental spot. And now she's ready to go because she doesn't have her phone with her. We've detached. I really think it's a case by case. I came into the gym this morning and I was kind of crunched for time. I put on 135, repped it out for six reps, and I put on 225. And then for the rest of the morning, I just did sets of 225. 
I've been looking for a little bit as most of us in here. So it's, it's just a case by case. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So you guys have a, an idea of what the template will be. So each time we'll have more of a specific case example. So we have this sheet right here that we will continue to review. Um, where are you have program? And I'll put this in there as your basic girl program. So then like, for example, you know, one that we haven't done, <clears throat> 35 year old female, 5'5, 165. Her BMI is 27 and a half. She's a physician. Here's the information about her. This is her current program. Let's design her a workout that's appropriate. Sometimes they're beginners, sometimes they're more advanced. These are taken right off of our website and people that we've actually taken through assessments. So you can see what those workouts look like. And then you'll we'll also parlay what that week looks like. I typically do not program for more than a week at a time just because of uncertainty. Your client could get sore. They could take a week off. I'm one of my clients I'm doing my online challenge with right now, no days off. Uh, she just texted me this morning. She's like, oh, um, I decided to go fly and see my daughter in Seattle. So I'm going to take the next five days off. Can we just do body weight? Yeah, that's fine. I can throw it together very simply. Now, if I would have spent 30 minutes on Sunday night writing out her whole entire workout for the week or the month, and then she throws me that curveball, then I wouldn't, and it's like almost wasted time. So, you know, there's, it's, it's a case by case. Sometimes you'll have a client, you know, I have a client who I want to do two weeks. Can you look at these two weeks? That's fine. It's a case by case. Any other questions? So tomorrow at eight o'clock AM, we'll be getting into our real first day of hip anatomy. We'll be going over the muscle groups, start getting into the slides, and then we'll have a three o'clock with the prehab guys. I will post today the updated um, schedule for the week. So you guys have that going forward and we appreciate you guys helping us out any way you can, you know, posting your story, tagging us. We like to share your guys' stories and just spreading the word showing up. So thank you guys for coming in tonight and let's go Crimson Tide five o'clock. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris. Have a great night.